Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Law Hour and Editorial Review. Now, the Law Hour is an educational service brought to you in the public interest. I'm your narrator, George Gordon. Now, the Law Hour and Editorial Review is heard nationally and internationally, seven days a week here in the United States and around the world in more than 120 countries worldwide over the Internet. For more information about the Law Hour and Editorial Review, please visit our webpage at georgegordonlaw.org. Again, that's georgegordonlaw.org. Now, the Law Hour and Editorial Review brings you important information about law, science, education, politics, religion, health, history, economics, news, and current events. All right, we've been talking about scientific frauds. It's a book written by Don Boys, B-O-Y-S, Ph.D., Evolution, Fact, Fraud, or Faith. I rated it about uh, number 10 on my on my list of uh, favorite evolution books. I wouldn't uh, I, I wouldn't rate it a number one out of 20 or a one in 20 or a one in 100 read because there's so many evolution books out there. This one's good. There's other good books out there, and you've probably read a bunch of them, but. This guy has a chapter 18 called Scientific Frauds, which I hadn't seen anywhere else, and he's got them all listed with the footnotes. And these footnotes are very important because it demonstrates to us the meticulous care that he went to when he made a statement. He said, here's where the statement came from. It came out of this book. It came out of this encyclopedia. It came out of this statement out of this guy's mouth. So when we're arguing about evolution and creation, and we're saying that these evolution guys over here are wrong and here's why, you can't get better evidence than the evidence or the admissions and confessions from the evolutionists themselves. So when somebody makes an admission or a confession, and then you can cite the date, time, and place that he made that statement, then he has condemned himself out of his own mouth. It's one thing for a creationist to come along on the scene and say, well, we believe in creation and the Bible says. It's something else when you have the admission from the evolutionist who says, we don't have any other explanation than that it was specifically created. That's dynamite. And that's where Don Boyes has excelled in this book. He has one confession after another. And the footnote that identifies who made the confession, when did he make it, and where can I go document it. Now he's got a section here on Peking Man. Peking Man was another of the scientific frauds that have come about in the 20th century to plague all of us, whether you're an evolutionist or a creationist or a spasmodic sentimentalist. We have all been affected by what we read in the newspapers, the news magazines, and we read in our college and high school textbooks. We believed a lot of lies. Now, Peking Man was one of them. And there was this Peking Man who arrived on the international scene back in 1927. Dr. Davidson Black had been involved with Piltdown Man. And in 1926, he was professor of anatomy at the medical college in Peking, China. Black received an annual grant from the Rockefeller Foundation to excavate at Chao Ku Tin. In charge of the assignment, Black was assisted by Dr. Pei, a Chinese scientist in charge of the fieldwork. Pierre... Teilhard, of Piltdown fame, was an advisor to Black. Teilhard had been censured by the Roman Catholic Church for his fanatical evolutionary views. Well, in 1927, while Piltdown Man was still riding high, a molar tooth was discovered, and Black announced another ape man had been unearthed. They named it Synanthropus, or Peking Man. In 1929, a skull was found, and Teilhart reported to Europe that the skull manifestly resembles the great apes close. However, the skull had a small brain capacity. Well, Dr. Black made a model, not a cast, no, 
but rather a model of the skull, and he wrote a long-winded article trying to sell this Peking man as an intermediate between Java man and Neanderthal man. Black represented the brain as being in the human range in opposition to Teilhard's description. Now, Black wanted an ape man, and he was going to have an ape man one way or the other. During further excavation, they discovered two huge heaps of ashes, both bones of numerous animals. They also found more small skulls, which Black claimed were more of this Peking man. Now, since only the skulls were found, no other parts of the anatomy, no arms, legs, hands, femurs, it was obvious the monkey-like skulls had been carried into the cave. There were no fossils to indicate how this creature walked or stood, but Teilhart proclaimed that Peking man had walked upright and was two-handed. <clears throat> well, my, my, what science can do. The world was excited about Peking man, a link with the past. The fact that traces of fire had been found proved that he was just across the line from animals. Here was Peking man who used crude tools, walked upright, lived in a cave, and used fire for cooking. The press and the world fell for it all over again. However, a very renowned paleontologist, Professor Abbe Bruel, visited the site in 1931. He returned to France asking questions that raised some serious doubts about Peking man. The traces of fire turned out to be huge industrial furnaces, and the professor, seeing the small skulls, asked how these creatures with such small brains could have worked such an industry. It was discovered that the traces of fire were as long as a football field, half as wide as a football field, and 30 feet high. The evidence proved that this was a large industry of converting lime, uh, limestone into lime carried on by advanced humans, probably in the construction of the ancient city of Kambuk near present-day Peking, China. Black and Teilhard did not reveal the extent of the ash heaps, calling them small hearth fires. Peking man was represented as living in a cave, huddled around his fire, but there was no cave. The respected Marcillian Boulet from the National Museum of Natural History in Paris was not an anti-evolutionist, but he was a scientist with character. Although he had been burned in the Neanderthal caper when he used pharaonology to determine intelligence, he visited the site, but believed that he had visited a site that wasted his time with monkey skulls. So he left the site convinced that the modern men had worked a large industry. He said the skulls and other animal bones found in the ashes were only the remains of food eaten by human workers who had tossed the bones into the ashes. Just when you think things can't get any worse, they usually do, and they did for Black and Teilhard. Well, in late 1933, three human skulls were unearthed, and more bones were discovered later as their house of cards came tumbling down. Black was found dead in his laboratory in March of 1934, and Dr. Franz Wallenreck replaced him as the top honcho, and he outdid Black. He produced his own model of Peking man using four different skull pieces, then had a sculptress by the name of Lucille Swan to mold it into a woman's head with a very thick neck. Evolutionists were limited only by their imagination, and they produced for the world an intermediate between ape and man. But it was not to be, and scientists, again, looked like fools, fanatics, and fakers. Now, in more recent discoveries, Dr. Louis Leakey and his wife discovered the East Africa man that was supposed to be almost two million years old, according to the University of California potassium argon process. Then they later stated that the age should be half a million years less because this was about a half a million years too great. Two films were made touting this amazing discovery. However, Dr. Leakey later admitted that his East Africa man, Zinjanthropus, was a variety 
of uh, Australopithecus, discovered in 1924 in South Africa. Most evolutionists still claim that Australopithecus was on his way to becoming human, but this claim has been challenged by evolutionists Lord Solly Zuckerman and Dr. Charles Oxnard. Now, Dr. Louis Leakey's son Richard, now an anthropologist, admitted that his famous father had found some extant apes. In fact, he admitted that his own findings destroyed all that we have seen or been taught about evolution. Richard had found skull number 1470 that was classified as homo, but it was dated at 3 million years. Well, that date was rejected by most evolutionists and brought down to 2 million years. Leakey has settled on 1.8 million years, and it was thought the skull was male. But now it is believed to be female. That tells us that many evolutionists should be classified as homo ignoramus since they really don't know very much of anything about the origin of man. Leakey does know that monkey makes the world go around, or rather money makes the world go around, so he keeps beating on the doors to raise funds to continue his bone hunting. Professor Enoch, in his Evolution or Creation, commented on Leakey's discovery, suggesting that it has not only blasted all of the previous speculations of human evolution from the ape or ape-like ancestors, but also now compels us to conclude that man was a separate creation from the beginning, being older than all the missing links and apes cited by evolutionists. Leakey, realizing this new information would require a total reevaluation of evolution, said, I have nothing to offer in its place. Well, Richard, I do. Try Genesis. But then evolutionists dare not even consider special creation since they would then have to answer to God. They prefer to deceive themselves into believing in the myth of ape men, and they keep looking for the missing links between lower forms of life and man. But they seek in vain, and about like a blind man in a dark basement looking for a black cat that isn't there. All right, now we have looked at life from space, uh, Archaeopteryx, Java Man, Neanderthal Man, Piltdown Man, Nebraska Man, Peking Man, East Africa Man, Zinjanthropus Africanus, and Zinjanthropus Osteopithecus. I'll get it right. Osteopithecus. And all of them are phony, all of them are fake, and all of them are documented as being fake. Well, now with that out of our way, we have another problem here with religious people, because the religious people believe in evolution. That's right. Not all of them, but most of them do. And there's a theory that's called the gap theory. I signed on to that years ago when I was a kid, because that's what I was taught. And I signed on to this theory of evolution when I was a kid because why would I have any reason not to believe in evolution? It's what we learned in school. It's what we learned in church. It's what we learned from our parents. It's what we read in the newspaper. And I was told that no thinking person, no nobody that's got a brain, you know, you know, above the speed limit would believe in anything other than evolution. So... Dr. Boyes here doesn't believe that. Now, there's a number of other scientists and a number of other people that don't believe in evolution, don't now, didn't then, have it in the past, and aren't about to in the future. I, I didn't know that. So, Dr. Boyes here in his book, Evolution, Fact, Fraud, or Faith, which you can probably get from your local used bookstore if you'd plug in the title, Evolution, Fact, Fraud, or Faith, written by Don Boyes. His name is B-O-Y-S, Ph.D. This is Freedom Publications, Post Office Box 981, Largo, Florida, 34649. If you think I went fast, I'll slow down. Freedom Publications is what it's called. That's the publisher. Post Office Box 981 in Largo, Florida, 34649. Now, this book is 16 years old. 
it may be that it's out of print. Maybe the publisher is no longer in existence. I don't know that one way or the other. And so when I'm trying to find a book like this, I like to start with bravenewbookstore.com. Hey, if you got anything like this, can you get it for me? And then when they tell me, no, we don't have it, we'll look for it for you, then I like to go down to my, my uh, Barnes & Noble. Barnes & Noble in Springfield, they're pretty good. And you tell them, here's what I'm looking for. They look it up and say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, no, we can't get this. Okay. So when you run into two blank walls like that, then you go to your used bookstore. So we like to go to the one down on uh, on Glenstone, Glenstone in St. Louis. And uh, we walk in there and we say, now, listen, we're looking for this book. And we give them the title and the author. And they type it into their computer. And they're tied into 450,000 used bookstores worldwide used bookstores in France and Germany and England and Ireland and Scotland, South Africa. I got a book one time out of Cape Town, South Africa. I got another one one time out of uh, Long Beach, California. Now, oftentimes, your local used bookstore will find that book for you, take your money right there, and then deliver it to you within two weeks. They'll, or sometimes even mail it to you. they just send it to you when it comes in from wherever it comes in, South Africa or or, uh, or uh, Long Beach, California. So tuck that one away in your heart. You'll be able to find books that you have thought have been out of print for a hundred years, and, and they have been. Uh, but they're out there. There's a few copies of them left, and when you ask for it with that kind of specificity, you can get them. Now, in trying to satisfy the people that just don't believe, while most thinking people believe God created everything, there are some professing Christians who are trying to construct a bridge between the fraud of gradualism and the fact of Genesis. However, the two teachings are diametrically opposite each other, and they're irreconcilable. Those Christians who are trying to satisfy unbelievers are erecting a bridge of mist, and all that try to cross are destined to fall into a noxious swamp of disbelief, disobedience, and dismay. Now, evolutionist William Provine of Cornell University maintains that people who try to hold to religious beliefs while accepting evolution have to check their brains at the church house door. And I think he's right. And they must also check their Bibles at the door because they surely aren't using them if they believe any form of macro evolution. So you got macro evolution and you got micro evolution. Now, Christians who hold any form of molecules to monkey to man evolution with one hand and to the Bible with the other are ridiculed by evolutionists who usually have more respect for creationists than they have for accommodators. Some Christians trying to accommodate unbelieving evolutionists have propounded various theories that are unscriptural and are out of step with Christian leaders throughout the ages. And they explain to us that they're only trying to use reason to solve the conflicts between science and the scripture. But we must always be careful that we don't use reason as an excuse for treason. Now, when we refuse to clear the clear teaching of the scripture, it become a traitor to his cause. And, of course, I am aware that good, even great men can disagree on the interpretation of scripture. But when men refuse to take the clear teaching of the Bible because it conflicts with some professoral speculator, it is treason. Now let's take a look at this gap theory. It's called the gap theory. One theory held by many Christians is called the gap theory. Most of us who are over 45 years old were taught this theory in Christian colleges. The theory was made popular by the Schofield Reference Bible in the early 1900s after a Scottish theologian, Thomas Chalmers, proposed it back in 1814. Basically, the theory says that God created the heavens, earth, animals, and even a pre-Adamic race maybe billions of years before Adam. Then a gap before Genesis 1 verse 2 is supposed to tell of divine judgment that devastated his original creation. This time between verse 1 and verse 2 
lasted billions of years and provides all the necessary time for strata to be laid, fossils to be encased in rock, coal to form, and then God restored everything with his six days of creation that we see in the balance of Genesis 1. Now, in addition to the following biblical problems, the believer in the gap theory has a major practical problem. How did the world exist and evolve for billions of years without the sun that was not created until the fourth day? However, this theory is pure speculation. It is without any scriptural justification. The gap theory is unscriptural. It's unscientific and it's unnecessary. Those who teach this misinterpretation tell us Genesis 1-2 really says, and the earth became without form and void. But in examining the exegetical evidence will not support that position. Professor M. Henkel of the Winona Lake School of Theology contacted 20 leading Hebrew scholars and asked if there was any evidence for a gap between verses 1 and 2 of Genesis 1, and they all replied, no. We are expected to believe that a perfect world became without form and void because of God's judgment. Many believe it was a result of Satan being cast down from heaven. The phrase, without form and void, means that the creation was not yet finished, and while the Bible teaches that Satan was thrown down from heaven, It does not tell us that there was a judgment upon God's creation as a result. That is, reading something into the text that isn't there. Without form and void does not mean chaotic. These are Hebrew words, tohu and wabohu, that mean empty and unformed. The earth was not yet finished for man's habitation. There were no flowers, rivers, fruit trees, grass, etc. But doesn't the fact that darkness was upon the face of the deep indicate that sin and judgment had contaminated God's creation? And the answer is not at all. For you should remember that God created light and darkness. And the psalmist wrote, Thou makest darkness and it is night. Psalm 104.20 So just as the day has various purposes, so the darkness of night has its purpose as well. And everything God created was very good. So whenever God created anything, he said it was good. But if, according to the proponents of the gap theory, God's creation had been cursed, Millions of his creatures had died and formed into fossils over millions of years, and Satan was now the god of this world. How could the scripture affirm in Genesis 1.31 that it was very good, if in fact it was not? Furthermore, in Romans 5 verse 12, we learn that death and destruction resulted from Adam's fall. After reading so many evolutionary textbooks, I believe Adam must have fallen on his head. Paul wrote, Wherefore, as by one man, referring to Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. Then Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5.21, By man came death. But if death, destruction, and decay happened between Genesis 1, verse 1, and Genesis 1, verse 2, then Paul was wrong. If death as a result of man's sin, then death had to follow man rather than precede him. So, no, the gap theory, while not a heresy, is a fairy tale for Christians. Believe it if you want to. But that is what Scripture teaches. Now, when Adam sinned in the garden, he lost his innocence and acquired a sinful nature that was naturally selfish, arrogant, dishonest. He no longer permitted God to control his life, 
and he sought his own way. He hid from God and covered himself with leaves. Man is still hiding from God. Some are hiding in great cathedrals, some in large universities, and some behind some very altruistic activities. Man, a sinner, had to develop a world view that would eliminate God and put himself on the throne. Man insists on control of his own life without interference from a personal God. Man can escape his dependence on God, but he cannot escape the consequences of that decision. Now, Aldous Huxley admits and admitted in this in one of his books, Ends and Means, he said, quote, I had motives for not wanting the world to have meaning consequently assumed that it had none and was able without any difficulty to find satisfying reasons for this assumption. The philosopher who finds no meaning in the world is not concerned exclusively with a problem in pure metaphysics. He is also or he is also concerned to prove that there is no valid reason why his friends should not seize political power and govern in the way that they find most advantageous to themselves. Now, as for myself, as no doubt for most of my contemporaries, the philosophy of meaninglessness was essentially an instrument of liberation. The liberation that we desired was simultaneously liberation from a certain system of morality. We objected to the morality because it interfered with our sexual freedom. We objected to the political and economic system because it was unjust. The supporters of these systems claimed that in some way they embodied the meaning a Christian meaning they insisted of the world. And there was one admirably simple method of confuting these people and at the same time justify ourselves in our political and erotic revolt. We could deny that the world had any meaning whatsoever. That is the most honest and perceptive statement that I have ever read and it shows the basis of evolution and humanism, Huxley was honest, but Huxley was a hedonist. And his hedonism came out on a television show when he was asked why evolution was so readily accepted. He replied that evolutionists accepted Darwin and Darwinism even without proof because they didn't want God to interfere with their sexual mores. That does explain a great deal, doesn't it? They expelled God from the universe so that they do not have to acknowledge that they will have to give an account to that Creator God. Now that's quite a little admission. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, Internet, or our several affiliates. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator for his holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. All right, we're reviewing a book here called Evolution Fact. What's the rest of it? Fact, 
Fraud or Faith, written by Don Boys, Ph.D. Rather than rated a 1 in 20 or 1 in 100, I said that uh, I've got about maybe 10 or 15 of these books here. The book that I rated as number one was called The Genesis Flood. That's a definite 1 in 100 book. You, you'll never read another one like that one. That's dynamite. This one here is just uh, normal black powder explosives. It's good. I'd rate it around my top ten, somewhere in my top top ten books on evolution, creation, and so on. Easy to read, plain, straight, uh, well documented, footnoted well. All the sources of information are located in here. And oftentimes I receive letters from people, you know, they'll say, hey, you made a mistake here, you made a mistake there. Now, I'm being pretty careful here like I did last week and the week before. When you have a controversial subject matter, you need to be careful lest you get branded now, you know, as anti-Semitic or, or uh, Neanderthal or, or you're um, uh, uneducated or something like that. Uh, you need to have your documentation well documented. And in this case, uh, this guy has done just exactly that. I'm, I'm being pretty careful here to go right along with his footnotes and stick right with the, uh, with the material. Now, like I did last week, these are actual admissions that come right out of the mouths of the evolutionists. This is what they're telling us. I, I'm not putting words in their mouths now. And Dodd Boys didn't do that either. We're not uh, we're not refuting and disagreeing with. We're simply saying, well, this is what the guy said, and here's when he said it, and here's the book that he said it in. It's his book. It's his story. Let him defend himself. And for that reason, I put it right up here at the at the top of my top ten. Now, when we talk about theistic evolution, what is that? Theistic evolution. Well, Augustine, Bishop of Alexandria, Egypt, taught that God created the world, but not in six literal days as recorded in Genesis 1 and 2, but only potential. In other words, God started everything and evolution slowly and developed what God intended to take place, and it's called theistic evolution. This is God started. God directed gradualism. But gradualism is not supported by scripture, and it's not supported by science either. Now, some Christians who hold this theory feel very comfortable with it because they think they have satisfied both science and the Bible, when they have actually satisfied neither one. They are neither fish nor fowl. Now, either God created the world as it says in Genesis, or he didn't. Theistic evolution is a very sick, very weak compromise with unbelieving scientists and those ungodly scientists who have more respect for creationists than they have for theistic evolutionists. But, we are asked from time to time, couldn't God have started everything billions of years ago and overseen the evolutionary process until, until man raised up on his two legs and walked out of a cave? Well, certainly, I believe he could have. But just because something is possible doesn't mean that it's probable, and it does, certainly doesn't mean that that's a fact of what happened. So even if something were possible, maybe even probable, it does not hold that it actually occurred that way. When you accept theistic evolution as an explanation for your present condition, you must be willing to go all the way with it. The creation was not finished on the sixth day, so creation is still continuing. Man is climbing higher and higher to his anticipated perfect, noble, and elevated state. And that's contrary to the clear Bible teaching that man is not ascending, he is degenerating. Besides, scientists will not permit any supernatural interference in man's origin because it leaves the door open for personal accountability. 
it defies the evolutionist's doctrine of naturalism that assumes the universe is a closed system of material causes and effects which prohibits any interference by a supernatural God. So how can a Christian twist the Bible like a pretzel trying to make it say what it doesn't say or mean what it doesn't mean? Furthermore, a sovereign God could create everything in a few days as easily as he could in a few billion years. And if it took God a few billion years to enact his creation instead of six literal days, then why didn't he say exactly what he meant to say? Of course, Christians believe that he did make himself very clear in Genesis concerning origins. Then we have another theory here. It's called the day-age theory. Another theory argues that each day in Genesis 1 and 2 means a long age of a thousand years in order to provide evolutionists with their millions of years to explain why God's creative acts. Evolutionists believe that with enough time anything can happen. Anything is possible. George Wald wrote, quote, Time is in fact the hero of the plot. The time with which we have to deal with is of the order of two billion years. What we regard as impossible on the basis of human experience is meaningless here. Given so much time, the impossible becomes possible, the possible becomes probable, and the probable becomes virtually certain. One has only to wait. Time itself performs all of the miracles. Wald has recently backed away from that position. Now, there are places when day does mean an indefinite period of time, such as the day of the Lord. But whenever the Bible speaks of a certain number of days, the meaning is always a literal 24-hour day. And Genesis speaks of the first day, second day, etc., without any reason to believe the meaning should be anything other than the normal meaning that it conveys in all other places in Scripture. The Hebrew words for morning and evening are each used over a hundred times in the Old Testament, and they're always used in the literal sense. So why would we try to make any other sense out of it? Was God confused as to what he wanted to convey? Or is it that the critics are confused? Was Christ in the grave three days or three ages? Was Jonah in the belly of the whale three ages? And how long is this age? Of course, those Christians who feel a need to explain away Genesis also would feel a need to give some human explanation for Jonah's three-day excursion in the deep. Had Lazarus been dead three days or three ages? So when Moses wrote in Exodus 20, verse 11, that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, why try to make anything but literal days out of that? There is surely no textual justification to believe anything other than what the Scripture plainly conveys. No one would ever attempt to make the days of Genesis 1 anything other than a 24-hour day except to reconcile the Bible account of creation with evolution. Why do we need to reconcile creation with evolution? But we're asked, how could the days be normal days since the sun was not created until the fourth day? Well, that's no problem because the sun doesn't shine for up to six months north of the Arctic Circle and south of the Antarctic Circle. And no one would agree that at the north or south pole a day is equivalent to six months somewhere else, would they? The Jewish Talmudic literature comments on almost every verse of Scripture, yet in no place is it suggested that the days of Genesis 1 are anything but normal 24-hour days. Moses used the Hebrew word yom for the day in Genesis 1.15 where he said God called the light yom and the evening and the morning were the first yom. Here, the day is re defined as the light period in the succession of periods of light and darkness. Remember that the reason the sun and moon were created was to rule the day and night. Furthermore, 
if God had intended for the days to be long periods of time, he could have had Moses use the Hebrew word olam, meaning long periods of time, instead of yom, which means day. Hebrew scholars agree with fundamental Christians concerning the literal days of Genesis. Professor James Barr, a renowned Hebrew scholar and Oriel professor of the interpretation of Holy Scripture at Oxford University, said in a personal letter on April 23, 1984, quote, So far as I know, there is no professor of Hebrew or Old Testament at any world-class university who does not believe that the writers of Genesis 1 through 11 intended to convey to their readers the ideas that a creation took place on a series of six days which were the same as the days of 24 hours that we now experience. And B, the figures contained in the Genesis genealogies provided by simple addition a chronology from the beginning of the world up to later stages in the biblical story. Noah's flood was understood to be worldwide and extinguished all human and animal life except for those in the ark. Genesis 2.13 tells us that God rested on the seventh day after concluding his six days of creation. Now, did God rest a day? Or did he rest for an age? And if he rested for an age, then how does that make a legitimate symbol for the Hebrews taking the seventh day as their Sabbath, as God had instructed them to do in Exodus 20, verses 10 and 11? Furthermore, Adam was created on the sixth day and lived in the garden and re the remainder of that day, and then he lived through the seventh day, and he was driven out of the garden on the eighth, ninth, or tenth day, or some other period of time. Did he live through parts of three or more different geological ages? And if so, he would have lived at least 500,000 years. Now, they lived a long time in those days, but they did not live several hundred thousand years. The scripture says Adam lived 930 years and he died. Now there are other reasons the days in Genesis 1 and 2 are literal 24-hour days. On the third day, God created grass, herbs, and trees, and every student knows that plants discharge life-giving oxygen and absorb poisonous carbon dioxide. The oxygen discharged by the plants is used by animals and people who then throw off carbon dioxide that is used by the plants. Just one of thousands of examples of phenomena that happened accidentally over a period of millions of years, according to the soothsayers. However, in the days, if these days were really ages, the plants could not have lived without carbon dioxide since animals were not created until the fifth day. Furthermore, grass and trees created on the third day could not grow without light, and the sun did not shine until the fourth day. So did the world spin millions of years without sunlight? And if the day was an age, the grass and trees could not have lived, so the days must have been a literal 24-hour period. The day-age theory is simply another myth that attempts to permit evolution and creation to kiss each other without accepting the clear teaching of the scripture. Now, why don't people believe the miracles of creation if they believe the miracles of the Gospels? And if Genesis 1 and, 1 and 2 are myths, then why is not John 3 a myth? No, the day-age theory like theistic evolution and the gap theory are so much poison claptrap, while organic evolution is a pretentious claptrap. We expect unbelieving scientists to ridicule special creation, but often Christian journalists do a better job than the unbelievers. Of course, often a Christian is identified as 
anyone with a dusty Bible on his coffee table and a membership in any kind of church. Now, there are accusations flying around. Donald Chittick uh, astutely points out this sad fact in his book, The Controversy, Creation versus Evolution. Even more sad is the situation in which Christians side with pagans in attacking biblical presuppositions. Creation and those who believe creation came in for special attack by those within the church who have adopted theistic evolution. For example, from just three articles appearing in Christian publications, receiving wide circulation within the Christian community, I find the following list of accusations hurled at those who believe in creationism. Creationists have a hidden agenda. They are dishonest. They have a poor strategy for Christian impact. They are aberrational, cultic, and lack training in historical sciences, especially biology and geology. Creationists have little contact with the scientific community. Creationists appeal to uninformed audiences. They do not make their case in established scientific channels, are not as honest as evolutionists, are unable to dent scientific orthodoxy, have a garbled message, have a message that is just plain wrong, have a message which often lacks accuracy. They have a message which often lacks balance. Christians or creationists magnify a particular view out of proportion. They are hyper-literalists, sweep aside evidence, present a caricature of the true Christian view. These creationists are isolationist, inflexible, and are doing more harm than good. They have abandoned science. They are kibitzers of science. Help perpetuate unbelief. Commit logical fallacies. Use verbal chicanery. Misuse scientific theory. Misinterpret the Bible. Creationists are guilty of the growing edge syndrome, logic, shadow box with straw men. Creationists strain factual data, abuse reason, and use circular reasoning. Creationists narrowly read scripture and are flagrantly ignoring scientific evidence. Well, now you know what Christianity today and eternity think about you if you believe the Bible. Of course you can find some of us who are guilty of some of the above. But it is outrageous for those magazines to suggest that the above are symptomatic of Bible-believing Christians. Those magazines are not known for their adherence to the veracity of Scripture, nor are they known for their balance. Sometimes they manage to raise to some heights of intellectual thought, but never to the height requiring additional oxygen. Now, in the following chapter, I will seek to prove that we will offer to do much better. Happier and scientifically correct if we simply accept the Bible for what it says. After proper exegesis, of course. God created all things by the word of his power in six literal days, and all of the thumb-sucking evolutionists, theistic or otherwise, in the world today cannot change that fact. Now, of course, a question arises in a lot of people's mind. Is creation a fact, or is evolution a fact? Now, we've been taught in our educational institutions, and that includes church, that Evolution is a fact. The church leaders, as well as the scientific and educational leaders, and the political leaders, have all signed on to the same story. They teach it as fact. But if we look at science, 
science tells us there's been no past eternity of matter. It's the first and second laws of thermodynamics. What does the Big Bang theory tell us? It tells us that matter it tells us that matter has always existed in total contradiction to the scientific facts that we all know to be true. Every scientist would tell you there's been no past eternity of matter and that the two laws of thermodynamics are true, accurate, and correct. They're testable and triable and provable in the laboratory. The Big Bang does not prove evolution. It's a theory. It is a philosophy. It is a religious faith. It's a religious faith like religion like a Baptist, like a Mormon, like a Catholic. It may have some truth to it, but it's basically flawed. And when we measure these standards, when we look at science to measure evolution, not the Bible, just science, evolution fails. Now, if we include the Bible, the eyewitness testimony of the Creator Himself, Evolution fails, and theistic evolution fails because theistic evolution is not scientific, and neither is evolution scientific. Theistic evolution is unscientific. Evolution is unscientific. Trying to satisfy evolutionists with the gap theory, or with theistic evolution, or the day-age theory, doesn't do service to either side. It doesn't explain the scripture and it doesn't explain science. It's an abortion, as we would say on the docs. Now the Law Hour and Editorial Review brings you important information about law, science, education, politics, religion, health, history, economics, news, and current events. For more information about the Law Hour and editorial review, please visit our webpage at georgegordonlaw.org. Again, that's georgegordonlaw.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Have you seen Left Behind movies? Have you read the Left Behind fictional book series? Not everyone believes Left Behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. Because they see the world stage shaping to fulfill what they have been led to believe is sound biblical interpretation, a left behind rapture scenario. This false view of prophecy is reinforced in the mind, not only of its 